So I'm also going to introduce our uh, keynote speaker here, um, Ranjan Nag. So Ranjan is an inventor and adjunct professor at Stanford University Genetics Department, founder of Ajamaica and R42 Group, which is a venture capital firm. He's won the 2021 IEE SCV Outstanding Engineer Award, the IET Mount Botten Medal, the One Million Verizon Powerful Answers Award, and the 2023 COGX uh, AI Conference Lifetime Achievement Award, um, and uh, the 2023 MIT Great Dome Award. He is owner of 100 AI biotech startups. His companies have been sold to Apple, BlackBerry, and Motorola. He teaches courses on AI, longevity, science, genes, ethics, and venture capital, and ha holds degrees from a PhD from Cambridge, a master's from M MIT, and a bachelor's from Birmingham. Welcome, Ranjan. Thank you. I think, that's, yeah. I think the mic works. Great, excellent. Thank you for having me. It's a great honor to be uh, first. And uh, we're going to have um, till uh, 9.45, is that right? Or well, 9.40? I don't know. Okay, well, let, I'll try and move quicker so we can lop up five minutes. But we've got a lot of uh, material. And uh, the first thing about me, I've really three personas. Uh, uh, certainly, I'm an inventor. Uh, done a lot of work in the mobile space. Uh, sold one company, Motorola, one to BlackBerry, one to Apple. So my reputation is... Uh, starting companies and selling them to uh, arrogant phone companies. Uh, but uh, uh, more recently, we're working on uh, AI and life sciences. I'm an investor. I'm not an owner. I'm a part owner, part owner of 100 companies, 100 AI biotech companies, uh, through uh, uh, myself at my uh, venture firm, R42. And of course, I'm a teacher at Stanford University. I teach uh, uh, longevity science and healthcare venture capital and AI genes and ethics, but also there's a project, Boundaries of Humanity, looking at the intersection of machines and humans, what that's going to look like in the next 20, 30 years, um, probably 30 years ago, you wouldn't even be allowed to even talk about that concept uh, without being thrown out the university, but uh, now you can. But I've been in really inventing for 40 years, uh, in, in, uh, really starting with... Uh, Speech recognition, handwriting recognition, did a lot of work in China, Chinese input systems. Uh, last 10 years, really looking at the intersection of mathematics and medicine, and uh, really been looking at AI for 30 years. This is an article, it's not 30 days old, which you can probably tell from the way it looks. Uh, for me, the picture of me, it's actually 30 years old, 30 years old exactly. Uh, and the title is Computers That Mimic the Brain. And uh, we're still talking about the same topic today. Uh, my prediction is uh, 30 years from now, we'll be continuing again. Uh, but that's one trend that's happening, uh, the, is looking at the intersection of computer science and biology. And R42 is my venture firm. It's also an institute, and we invest in AI and longevity science companies. Uh, so a lot of activity. Uh, there's a number of courses I teach at Stanford that you know, kind of have to be a Stanford student to take them. Uh, but uh, there's some courses that anyone can take, uh, the ones through the Continuing Studies program. And uh, anyone's welcome to that. They're Stanford's cheapest courses. Uh, I think there's a few hundred dollars uh, to take. And they're uh, online uh, as well as in person. Uh, the papers that uh, the students do at the university are also online. So those of you who are interested, they're usually quite interesting, uh, different topics on different uh, areas of aging and science and society. Uh, so we have a wide variety of students from every department uh, from the university and every uh, subject. But going back to this intersection, there's an inflection point in biology and in computer science. Uh, certainly, you know, we, I think people think longevity is hot, but AI is white hot. Literally every day there's an article, and it's moving so fast. Even in two weeks, three weeks, there's a new innovation coming out, a new large language model. Uh, but it's actually uh, the term artificial intelligence was coined in 1956 uh, at uh, Dartmouth. Uh, so it's a long time in concept, and you can even date it back to 1936, where Alan Turing uh, proposed the Turing machine, and where lifespans were much, much, much smaller then. 
and uh, we're seeing innovations, also an inflection point in biology, uh, namely specifically, clearly uh, decades ago, antibiotics and vaccines came about, but we also see uh, today CRISPR uh, gene editing, which uh, I think uh, hit, hit the news you know, 10, 12 years ago uh, with a big bang, but it seemed to be quite slow in coming, but we're seeing finally the first gene editing um, uh, 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 solutions for sickle cell and anemia pop up. And uh, so we've got these inflection points of large amounts of data. Uh, Mike will talk about personalized medicine and more data uh, there. Uh, and and, and uh, we can get to sort of uh, 100, 122 is the oldest living person, Jean Coleman, uh, who uh, actually started smoking at the age of 112. Uh, 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 and uh, a little bit about, I did research a little bit about her. There was, there was some commentary, it's not really her, it's her daughter, et cetera, but I think now people think it really was her. Uh, and uh, you know, she grew up with a very low-stress life, uh, very social, uh, she was wealthy, and um, lived an interesting life. And it seems like many things in biology, things seem to intersect at around like 116, 118 kind of mark. You know, your telomeres, if you plot it out, uh, they seem to get smaller and smaller, and they get to zero around about the 117 mark, if you actually last that long. Uh, the oldest living person, and I have to update this just to double check every time I give a talk, uh, is um, Maria here, who was actually born in San Francisco. So you don't actually need to live in a blue zone to live a long time. Uh, she lives in Spain, however, having said that, uh, though born here. And this is going to be a macro trend of uh, a shift in demographics in society. Uh, right now, it's probably 10% above the age of 65. If you hit 2050, be 20% above 65. We're seeing this in Japan happening now. You know, in Japan, there's uh, limited immigration. Uh, and there's physically not enough young people to look after the old people. So if you look at this chart at the right-hand side, there'll be a, a lot more even numbers of people in every age range. And uh, it, you know, it used to be that you think about retiring at, in your 50s and 60s, you're preparing for that, but people are too fit and too healthy uh, to do that. And they want to keep going, they want to keep working, and they sometimes physically can't stop working uh, because of the economics of uh, being able to work. Uh, that just can't physically uh, pay to put food on the, on the table. So we're going to have a different dynamics in the next 10, 15 years. Mark Zuckerberg famously said 20 years ago, uh, said, well, we don't need any people over the age of 40 working for our company at Facebook. Uh, I think his HR people slapped his wrist for that. But now they are, now they are for, he's now, he, he, he's at 40. He's not, I don't think he has the same view now. Uh, 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 and so, uh, what is it like to be aging? This is a, a word cloud that I ask my students, and uh, this is one for the evening class, which we have everyone from age 18 to 90. Uh, the afternoon class is uh, more Stanford students, where it's more the, the upper age is like 40 or so. Uh, and it's not always bad. You know, we see we do see some sort of things that are not so nice, uh, back pain and creakiness and. Uh, dementia, no, there's more age-related diseases, uh, but we see some positives, wisdom, uh, humor, uh, and openness, uh, no more people, wealth. Uh, so uh, this comes to the concept of what is age? What is real age? Age is, first of all, chronological age. You really can't change that. Just the number of days you've been here on the planet. Uh, and then... Uh, Biological age, is that different? That's how you feel. That's how some of the biomarkers of that can be measured of your body. And that, does that adapt to where, you're at, where you are? Um, by the way, these slides, if anyone wants to send me an email, or I think they, they'll be put on the website, I guess I'm not sure. But you, you can get these slides, no secret about these. Uh, so what is it uh, for lifestyle? One of the first things I came across, I always thought that uh, you had to have good parents to live a long time. We've probably all heard that phrase. The best thing you do is have good parents who lived a long time and then you're fine. Uh, and then as you start double clicking into this, uh, there's more uh, sort of nuances on where that is. And this is as a statistician, as a computer scientist looking at data, uh, you, you say, well, actually it may not be that. So the, the latest sort of stats is that it, it sort of really 
no, as low as 6%, as high as 30% is genetics. Now, why is that? It doesn't feel right, you know, because we, we know lots of families that have got old age people in their families and the, the, the whole family lives to a long life. Well, what happens is if you're 100 years old or even 90 years old or even 80 years old, there's so much stuff going on, it's very difficult to tease apart the confounding variables. Uh, uh, you know, of what happened in your 90-year life or your 100-year life. It's very, very difficult to tease it apart. And so what might be, your mother might, be, um, might have lived uh, as a Buddhist and a vegetarian. So what about you? Well, you're vegetarian too. Uh, maybe you're not Buddhist, but you're, you do meditate. And what's been transferred is the uh, lifestyle values, not the genetics. And so you can see articles like this in that well-known scientific journal, the Wall Street Journal, uh, which uh, anecdotally a few weeks ago came up uh, with these numbers. And I guess up to 90, they're saying up to 25%, uh, 150% is genetics, uh, 175% is genetics. Um, I'd probably challenge that a little bit. Uh, sort of, again, you have to do a much deeper analysis of causation and correlation of what's actually happening over a 106-year-old life. If you started smoking at 112, could Jean Colmet, got, could, have, could she have got to 130 if she'd not done that? We don't know. Uh, and there's 79 organs in the body, and they all age differently. And how do we do this? And, uh, and a lot of people ask me, Ron John, you know, you've, you've researched this area in the longevity space, you've talked to all these scientists, well, what should we do? And I usually say, well, why don't we just start with this called level one? Let's just start with diet, exercise, and sleep, which most of us don't do at the optimum level. And then we can look at fancy stuff and look at what aging actually is. So aging, we have a number of diseases that are correlated with aging, and traditional biotech uh, from an investment point of view, looks at each of these diseases one at a time and tries to solve them one at a time. The other theory is, well, can we actually find something that fixes all these things all at once? And then we get 10 diseases solved for the price of one. So last week I was in uh, Saudi Arabia, so, and they announced the uh, $101 million X Prize. So I'll give a few comments on this. So just a few basics on this as you start looking at the uh, material, uh, any of us can apply, probably at this conference, maybe we can have little groups, can decide, because it's 100 million, million, 101 million dollars is a lot of money, uh, but maybe we, need, maybe we don't want 20 people in a group, or maybe we want three people, how, how, do, how do we share it out? We'll have, we'll have to decide that. Uh, but the idea is to get extra minimum of 10 and, um, and up to 20 years increase in life for, 65, for people who are 65 to 80 year olds who are free of disease and life-threatening um, uh, diseases and disability. Can they actually get uh, another 10 or 20 years? And they have to take the solution in one year or less and then prove three domains. So you could have a deba debate, you know, what domains uh, are uh, part of aging, but these are the three that were chosen in competition. Uh, cognition, uh, immune system, and muscle. Uh, and so I guess there's six months or so where you can actually comment on whether these are the right characteristics. But here's my comments on what we do. If we want to do it, win this prize, and I think R42, we will actually put an entry in. Uh, maybe Stanford will put an entry in. Maybe the Buck Institute will put an entry. There are lots of smart people here. Uh, and see, so what's my comments? So first of all, the competition lasts seven years. So if it's seven years, there's actually no time to invent a new drug from scratch. Uh, if you're on the way of inventing one, if you've got something that uh, is in a phase one, phase two, maybe, maybe they'll accept a phase two trial. Uh, so what's the implication of that? That means you're going to have to not invent a new drug. And, and this, this is known as drug repurposing. So there's a school of thought, we don't need to invent any new drugs. They've already been invented. We just have to use the existing ones in new combinations. Second idea is actually don't invent a drug, just come up with a regime uh, existing, you no, know, use diet, exercise, sleep, but that's easy to say, uh, but how do you do it optimally? It, obviously, compliance would be very, is very, very difficult for most of us. Uh, a lot of us want to, uh, we know, we sort of you know, restrict our sugar, you know, do intermittent fasting, do exercise, uh, but a lot of us don't do it. 
Uh, but what if we, asked, we were told you get $101 million if you do it for a year? Uh, you, might, you might actually do it uh, differently. Uh, mitochondria, that could be something, uh, that mitochondria transfer. Uh, so what this competition means, you'd have to actually look at things that can be done in a seven-year process. So it may not be optimum. There might be other things you can do that will take us longer, longer to do. And I really think there's the three inflection points. One is... AI, generative AI, uh, you know, we're now getting to the stage. I think the Star Trek view is eventually you won't need to do trials. The computer simulation is actually more accurate than the trial. Uh, and you're starting to see that in protein folding. When the protein folding uh, alpha fold came out, uh, people said, uh, uh, well, we know it, the simulation works because the experiments match our simulation. Now I'm reading papers the other way around. My experiments work. I know my experiments were right because it matches the computer simulation. So it's the other way around. If you look at it, play it forward, whether it's 100 years or 10 years, um, you'll generate your treatment in a computer. So that's an inflection point. Gene editing, the second inflection point. We're just getting the first gene editing uh, therapies. The only problem, the dirty secret is, is getting complex gene edits uh, and... Uh, is most diseases have a long tail of genes, not just one gene. So you want to get more than that. It's, got, it's very, very inaccurate toxicity. But there's a mini industry of a new generation, of second generation companies that are trying to generate complex edits. Can we get that in the seven years? Not sure. Uh, we talked about mitochondrial transfer, um, epigenetics. Uh, I think there's speakers uh, later on who will talk about that. These are the Yamanaka factors. Yamanaka got the Nobel Prize. He said there's four things uh, that if you change, you can stay and change a cell from current state to uh, state zero. Uh, uh, if you change three of those, it reduces... Uh, you, you, uh, the problem is if, four, if you do all four, you have some cancer risk, but three of them you have reduced cancer risk. So I'm voting with my feet, you know. Um, R42, we've got a number of companies we've invested in and working with and uh, looking at trying to look at many of these things on a, uh, 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 in many dimensions. Uh, are you going to be able to find one thing to just fix everything, or is it going to be a combination, a cocktail of these things? My personal opinion, it will be a cocktail of these uh, different things. And we will then be able to crack this 90, 95 barrier. Uh, if you use diet, exercise, and a few medicines, uh, we can get to this 90, 95 barrier. The average age of death today is 76, down from 78, so average age is actually dropping. Uh, but because I went to MIT, I like numbers. Uh, the key word being average, there's actually more people hitting the age 100 than ever before. Uh, but that seems to be like the maximum. Maybe you can get to 110. We saw the 116 year old lady, the 122 year old, and a lot of biological phenomena. They seem to triangulate that. Trying to get more than that is going to be uh, quite difficult. You know, everything we've seen today only gets to you know, the next 20 years or so. And uh, so I'm going to come up with this idea of a vaccine for aging. Uh, so people tell me, uh, OK, I'm, you're working on a vaccine. What's so special about that? Well, mine's for aging. Uh, and what does that actually mean? And if you can actually cure uh, aging, if you can actually do aging, you solve many diseases uh, all at once and increase that maximum uh, 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 date. And fundamental this is using artificial intelligence. Uh, we are at an inflection point there. Biologists can now do computer science. And guess what? Computer scientists can now do biology, right? It's, uh, it's it can actually, uh, the things that we're seeing now, there's a million papers published every year in medicine. Nobody's got time to read them. You can have a machine read them now and come out with innovations sp spit out by the machine that you would not have thought of by yourself. You can retrain on the health and age level. You want to tra change that data. And uh, so current medicine is aging is not defined as a disease. Uh, it's, it's not targeting root causes. 
What we want to look at future medicine would be different. If you actually go to your doctor today, your yearly physical, they'll say, oh, you're 50 now, time for your colonoscopy. Uh, maybe that'll be different. They say, well, you've got a particular genetic makeup that we should actually give you colonoscopy at 40. Uh, Katie Couric's husband has got this campaign to, Katie Couric has got this campaign to have more screening because her husband died much younger than the screening uh, uh, level. And so, uh, on the AI side, biomarkers, I did a whole day on it yesterday, I think there'll be more people talking about it today. There's all kinds of things you can get. I'm not sure if anyone's tried this uh, by Alex Javanovsky at aging.ai. You can take your blood uh, metrics and, uh, uh, that you take in one, one every year, the physical, and you can stick them into aging.ai. Uh, they've got European measures and... Uh, uh, American measures, and uh, it'll tell you how old you are. Um, oops, where's it going? Uh, right. And so the idea is then get personalized treatments for you and not the general case. So what is a vaccine for aging? So what do I mean by a vaccine? So historically, vaccines are really applied to the immune system. The body is given a dead pathogen or a weak pathogen, to give the body a chance to practice so when it sees the real thing, it can actually uh, uh, take action. Uh, I really want to elevate that definition. So when we first invented vaccines, the immune system was what we wanted to optimize for and what we work on. We have now more tools available to us. We have genomics, we have transcriptomics, we have gene editing. We want to actually use the same concept of what a vaccine is to protect you from bad things. And bad things might be senescent cells, Senescent cells are old cells. Uh, usually the immune system clears them out. Uh, but if they don't clear them out, they block your arteries. All sorts of things uh, happen to you. Uh, if you tend to uh, remove these old cells, you've got younger mouse, faster mouse, uh, stronger mice uh, to do things. And this goes to some work that people are thinking of the concept of a vaccine. It's this work from Minamino in Japan uh, to says, well, OK, can we find a gene marker and he's found a gene marker, GP, the GPNMB gene, to actually attack and then clear those cells out once we can mark those cells. Because the problem is, if you have a drug, you might be able to get rid of the senescent cells, but you'll get rid of the healthy cells too. And that's the difficulty that we want to try and solve. And um, his results on mice, very good. Uh, this is an arteriosclerosis, uh, clears them out. The problem is, does it work on every organ? Uh, do we actually... Uh, have a signature that can cover many, many organs, many, many diseases. And my belief is it's going to be a cocktail that you're going to have to do that. And so this is where Agemica comes in. It's a project that's looking at uh, uh, gene expression data, look, tries to look at multiple pathways to find signatures across uh, many, many uh, diseases. And so anyone can come with a computational platform but, and come up with a list of things that can help you, but can it actually help you? And, you, know, you don't really know for another 15 years whether uh, the trials will actually work. So what we did here was we said, OK, we know what drugs are currently used for lots and lots of diseases. Uh, can we actually predict those drugs blinded without actually knowing uh, the information? Uh, purely from databases that we actually have. And it turns out our platform does. It actually does do that. Uh, clearly in the top 10 level, and it doesn't mean our top one doesn't work, but the standard care peers in the top 10. So the idea is come out with a vaccine that is sort of open. It could be a set of drugs, it could be a supplement. And then use machine learning to actually uh, give this trick one to increase the probability. So we invented another company, Superbio, which has uh, a thousand different machine learning libraries that uh, you can just upload data and click train and not write any code. This is an accelerator, this is an accelerant. So you don't actually have to have a degree in artificial intelligence to actually use artificial intelligence. Suddenly you don't need a degree in biology to use these systems. It's the, it's the same idea. That's trick one. Trick two, drug repurposing. Uh, use existing drugs. Because the existing drugs have all got passed through safety, uh, they have all passed through uh, some level of approval, uh, we have to get it faster. Because even if you increase the probability of success, 
you still have the trials. So we have to sort of increase, uh, decrease that time. Okay, let's see. Uh, we'll flick through. Uh, yeah, mitochondria. Uh, is there something uh, I'm, I'm making a big bet on? Uh, can we actually improve our mitochondria? Mitochondria are the battery packs of our cells. As we get older, the integrity becomes weaker. Can we replace our mitochondria? Can we get new ones? Uh, and this comes back to uh, the, uh, this is from Metrix, where maybe the body, you can think of it as a laptop. You have to replace the battery, which is your mitochondria. You have to get rid of the senescent cells, which is your dirt and dust. And then you have to reprogram the operating system, do epigenetic reprogramming. And can we do that by ourselves in a combination? Uh, and can we do it quickly? Some of you here, you've got time. Some of us haven't got time. So uh, we've got to uh, do it in finite time. Maybe we can get a better result. Now, how old am I? So this is how old am I. So I think these days, because if you're going to listen to someone that, who's talking about aging science, you no, know, does he actually walk the talk? Uh, so these are my results uh, on, uh, and it ranges from 20 to 52. Uh, so my favorite tests are obviously the 20 ones. Um, which, uh, and actually I've took Kristin's uh, aging, brain aging, on some of those I'm in the 20s, right, on the brain aging. Doesn't mean I'm clever though, she tells me. It just means my brain aging is <laughs> younger. Uh, and uh, how do I get some of these numbers? You know, the VO2 max 56. So um, just to give you an input on that. Uh, so I'm a runner. So this well-known scientific journal, the New York Times, uh, came up with this article. Uh, one hour of running adds seven years to your life. Adds seven hours to your life. Is there any any substance to that? And um, there's a little bit of evidence. Uh, this is from uh, uh, Tom Rando's work uh, that uh, some you know if you actually uh, do exercise, maybe there's some impact on your stem cells, even on your brain. Often people say if you have uh, uh, you detect you might be at risk to early onset Alzheimer's. They don't say tell you to do play chess more. They tell you to do better diet, better exercise. Uh, and do you have to run all the time? If you have to run all the time, then you uh, uh, it's going to take a lot of people won't do it. But it turns out if you just just do run run a little bit, even just once a week, you can have a big impact. And so these are my running times. So I'm always asking. So Mike's on next. We have to ask him what his running time is, and if it's better than mine, we have to listen to him. <laughs> ask every speaker. Uh, so uh, let's see. Where are we at? How many? What's the time? I've got a few, four or five minutes. Uh, so the, one of the problems is is causation and correlation. Let me get this concept. You have to be careful when you listen to everybody, including me, uh, because you'll see nearly every concept, there's an article proposing you should do this, run, and an article proposing you shouldn't do this, don't run, because you know, you'll get injured. And uh, what I like is this concept known as Bradford Hill. Bradford Hill is actually a 60-year-old, actually 80-year-old concept, Sir Austin Bradford Hill. He was trying to prove that smoking caused cancer in 1965. And in those days, we didn't actually have uh, databases of, uh, of, of uh, biological data. Uh, even DNA was relatively recent at that time. And it was actually quite difficult, because what you'd see is uh, this delineation between causation and correlation was quite difficult to figure out. Uh, you know, you'd see a chart like this, which says uh, the number of letters in the uh, National Spelling Bee competition plotted against the number of people killed by venomous spiders, it looks like it kind of matches. And so obviously they're, they're, one, one must be related to the other. And there's so many examples in biology, in math, and particularly in AI, people don't realize AI is really doing correlations, not causations. It's another level. So Bradford Hill came with, I think, one of the most simplest uh, frameworks. There's still a lot of critique on it, but he said, look, how do I prove smoking caused cancer. So he came with a nine-point checklist. And, uh, and so I asked all my companies if they want to prove something, show me your Bradford Hill analysis. So he said, if you smoke more, do you get more cancer? Yes. OK, do French people get cancer as well as British people, as well as Chinese people, as well as Indian people in their different cities? Yes. Uh, specificity, is there any other reason? Do they happen to live near a coal mine? Are they a coal miner uh, as well? 
Uh, temporality. Do you get the cancer after you've smoked, not before? Uh, these are just basic uh, concepts. Uh, and then experimentation. Is there actually a mechanism that could actually explain why this is happening? So biologists tend to focus purely on the mechanism. Computer scientists, we focus on the data. You need both. Uh, coherence. Do they actually uh, increase the likelihood effect? Analogy. Are there other 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 factors? You know, for example, if something worked, do you know if you get, if if uh, unfortunately they did do experiments on this, you know, make rabbits smoke and if uh, pigs smoke and humans smoke and they all get lung cancer, uh, it's more likely that you are. And there's still some critiques because, you know, there's other confounding factors and maybe you should look at the mechanism. But a lot of things that I look at uh, just show that spider uh, spelling bee type chart and expect us to believe it. And so. Um, no, Judea Pearl, he got the Turing Award, which is like the Nobel Prize of Computer Science, wrote a reasonably accessible book. I would say it's not completely accessible, but um, it says differentiate between cause and effect. Uh, okay, so I think we're coming to the end. Uh, what am I working on? Agemica, which is a vaccine for aging. Uh, Superbio, which is really leads on because I need to solve that problem. I need to use AI, so I need every AI library out there. Uh, if you want to talk to me, my email is here, and uh, my uh, call, email me anytime. Or you can talk to my avatar, and uh, you can talk to my avatar. Uh, it's one of our other companies, and I said I actually entered the question: Is the avatar is actually cleverer than me because it's trained the entire internet and all my uh, lectures and? Material. It says, how do I win the X, uh, the X Prize? And it says, uh, I would assemble a multidisciplinary team to develop innovative solutions that extend human health span. We'd focus on breakthroughs in areas such as genomics, AI, and biotechnology with an emphasis on accessibility and affordability for all. So I think that's probably a good answer. So uh, I think we've uh, hit it exactly at night, exactly on time. Thank you very much. Over there. Yes, go ahead. Uh, one of the big questions yesterday was how do we define aging? If you're creating a vaccine for aging, what is your definition yeah. of aging? So one of the problems, this is this is very perfect because you don't want to wait 50 years <laughs> or 60 years, right, to find out if it works. Uh, in practice, you will have to wait 60 years, right? So the other concept is using biomarkers, which uh, actually do show aging and we showed some of those things um that you know even my own thing oops it's gone now but it's a uh, uh we said no my vo2 max my telomeres but these things i think there's no real uh absolute consensus i think yesterday's meeting is trying to figure out your the consensus of what what you actually have to do um to find uh, the thing that will actually work uh, methylation tests etc etc i think some of those things again it goes back to this causation correlation thing. A lot of people think we've, we've got these charts, but a lot of things may be not linear. So as we get to the older ages, uh, where we don't have as much data, you go to supercentenarians. Uh, I think there's a supercentenarian data. Only it's only got like uh, 500 people in it. Uh, it's going to be more difficult, but we're going to have to make do with what we've got and take our best shot. Mike, he's gone, Mike. Are we on? Yep. Is your vaccination focused on senescent cells? No. Senescent cells won't solve everything. I don't think it will. Uh, senescent cells are just one of the components. It goes back to a cocktail. Yeah, We're so have it's to... in your cocktail. Yeah, it's in the cocktail. Unless it's a secret formula. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, maybe, maybe, maybe it's not secret, but it'll be... Uh, it's in your cocktail. But, but, but the idea is trying to find multiple pathways that spread across as many age-correlated uh, uh, diseases as possible with a finite set. Um, uh, if you just do senescent cells, I think, yeah, you'll get some improvements and all that, but I think it goes back to my laptop analogy, or uh, uh, Tom Benson's laptop analogy, he thought of it, is you're going to have to probably look at all those dimensions. Can you do it with three things, three concepts, four concepts? That might get you quite far. I don't know. Over there, right at the back. Hi, uh, excellent talk. So I definitely agree with the idea that 
the ultimate goal of biology is to put things into the computer and do the trials in the computer. What do you think we're missing today to get there, and what's the roadmap? Excellent question. Uh, one idea is we are, have fragmented databases. We have fragmented biological data. There's some governments who've sort of put things up there. Uh, there's some concept in computer science known as heterogeneous databases, where you try and get databases from different fields, different places, and put them all in one place. And usually what you find, there's duplicates, missing values, missing rows, all these things. There's a whole science around that, putting that. But no one, and it's a whole, it's really an engineering exercise. I've not seen anyone doing that. If we had that all in one place, uh, actually, even within a university, you know, we find getting one database from one department to another is a fight, uh, right? But can we get that on a world-level basis? I think that's for a role for governments, uh, because depending on which country you're in, you can incentivize people to uh, provide data into a centralized database that everyone can use. A second point is uh, there's so many, it's what we kind of do in Supervisor, there's so many niche libraries to solve individual problems. Uh, we need an entire repository. We're trying to do that on the private sector way. It could be something on the public sector where, where you sort of uh, have a collection of libraries that are not hidden that you can use on many different problems. So those are two things I'd work on. Thank you. Yes, over here. <laughs> so when you're talking about the database or something, what the computer is using or what we are trying to extract the resource for the future of aging research. Most of this data comes from either from mice experiments or from some other things. But the problem with murine models is that we know we have cured many diseases in murine models. But when it goes to the clinic, most of the drugs fail. No, I what agree is the take? I agree with you completely. It's a 5% chance going from mouse to a fully approved drug. And in Alzheimer's, it's a 0% chance. Well, a bit, little bit more than zero, but not much more. Uh, and so I'm not a mouse, you're not a mouse. Uh, and so it goes back to that uh, uh, causation correlation. You have to say, OK, uh, and we're trying to do, I've thrown a few concepts. Drug drug's actually already gone through. It's on humans. So OK, at least we know it's safe. It works for something. Will it work for something else? Uh, can you actually? Uh, 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 see that this uh, mechanism works in the same way in multiple species is another idea. Right, okay, it works in mice, it works in worms, it works in rabbits, it works in pigs, it works in dogs. Okay, maybe it'll work in humans. Even then, it's a, you know, we have bigger, bigger issues. You know, our brain's much more different to, uh, to other people. So you have to go back to the data and, and say, before you spend you know, $200 million going through trials, can we actually use the AI, causation, correlation, knowing that's mainly correlation, but can we use these uh, concepts of causality to uh, not waste eight years and $200 million to go to the next step? And then we only have, as a world, we only have finite resources. Can we sort of double click? I, I'm moderately optimistic, actually, that, uh, uh, in fact, just having less money can actually help because you're forced to think more cleverly. Okay, are we, that was the last question, is that right, Christine?